Hold on, guys. I think I brought this again. <laughs> Okay, okay. So today we're going to talk about ferns, and then we will see some ferns on Thursday. Thought about cutting up flowers today, but we're going to buy Valentine's Day flowers on sale and chop them up in the future. So it's fun. I promise. Well, I think it's fun. We're gonna we're gonna learn to load some scalpels in the future and cut up some flowers. It's one of my favorite things to do, but we didn't swing it for today. I got really expensive this year. Okay. So ferns, we're gonna walk through our tree. So we're moving into our vascular plants. So last time we talked about our mosses, our non-vascular plants. Um, they did reproduce with spores. We're going to see that again today in the ferns. Um, but now we're we're moving into the plants people start to typically think about as plants. But I want to do one thing with you first, just make a note. Uh, and this is because I saw a 
friend complaining on Twitter that their grad students don't realize this. So you guys are going to be better than my friend's grad students. Okay. So a note about like reading trees, these phylogenetic trees we've been talking about. Okay. So I've broken this up as like a family tree because essentially that's what we're doing when we're building phylogeny, right? We're tracing lines of descent, just like you might if you're mapping out a family tree. Um, have you guys done pedigrees in any of your classes? Okay, cool. So we're basically doing that. We've just shaped it a little differently um, because instead of thinking of uh, sexual reproduction and having two parents, we're just thinking about splits. So I've just left on here our uh, sort of maternal side of the tree. Okay, but this is what we are looking at when we look at a phylogeny. Okay, so over here, we have a little tree. Here we have yourself or this person, right? Just pull some of these images off Google Images and pasted them onto a phylogeny, right? So you have a sibling here. You got some cousins. You got your second cousin. And what we've done is trace back and just show the last common ancestor for some of these groups, right? So when we are doing phylogenies, this is the same thing that we're doing, right? So on any of these branches, we might, if we focused in deeper, have more nodes, we might have fossils. There might be other species in here. For sure, there are other mutations, adaptations that you're not focusing on, right? So some common misconceptions when people are looking at trees because we have them all in a nice little order in the depiction, is we sometimes, if we don't think deeply about it, kind of think oldest, next oldest, and so on towards whatever our focus group is. But that's not actually what's going on when you look at a phylogenetic tree, right? Evolution is actually not like progressing towards some ideal form necessarily. We're just having a bunch of branching, a bunch of changes uh, that hopefully happen to be adaptive at any given moment, right? So what we want to realize when we're looking at these, when we think about an outgroup, which we do put on our trees for comparison purposes, right? If you think about a family, right, your second cousin versus yourself, you're not really saying if you look at a tree like this that your second cousin is more like your great grandmother than you are right you're not saying that this person um is your ancestral form right your second cousin is not your great grandmother reincarnated or carried forward into the present without any changes right what we're just saying is that that branch diverges earlier okay all of our sort of so our group at the tips of these branches are things that are living and extant now. So they, they've all undergone uh, adaptation, evolution throughout. So that's a thing that, that sometimes trips people up if you're not slowly thinking about the tree. Okay. So I've done this out and shown us the same tree in a couple different forms. So another thing to realize, right? is that we choose to like figure out how we're gonna graphically re represent a tree, right? We've seen a number of different forms of trees of phylogeny, right? We saw the circle ones, we saw ones where we have stepped out branches kind of in that sort of square rectangular kind of format. We've seen these more triangular ones, right? These are all choices. Um, another thing we actually do get to choose because these are just nested branching points, right? Like whether your cousins are on the left or on the right at this branching point, right? That's not meaningful. It, it doesn't matter. This is the same tree as that other tree where this little me character was over all the way on the left. So this is an equally valid way to represent the exact same uh, piece of information. Okay. So when you're looking at trees, and you're trying to decide uh, what changes you're looking at in terms of their data and in terms of what they mean uh, for our understanding of evolution. There are certain things that are that are just design choices, essentially. Um, 
So it's kind of like in an essay, right? You can use the same facts to make different arguments or to emphasize different things, depending on what you talk about first, what you talk about second. That's kind of what we're doing graphically when we're building trees too. Like often our choices are to highlight whatever question we were trying to answer um, by building that tree. So here are just some more reshapings of, of that same tree. Okay. Okay, actually, questions about looking at trees in this way. Cool. Okay. So all of that to preface, um, when we talk about evolution of plants, right, we do think, or we often do talk about the mosses that we looked at last time as like really basic, really basal, right? But that's not strictly evolutionarily true, there would be other things along in here. It's just that there is a much older common ancestor compared to our modern flowering plants, right? People are often really focused on our modern angiosperm flowering plants because that's our most recent branch off. Um, and it's a lot of our food plants, our house plants, the plants we interact with uh, from an economic perspective every day. So that's often going to look like the focus in a tree of plants, but that doesn't actually necessarily mean that this is the most evolved most important thing. I just wanted to start by that. All right, so we're gonna move into our vascular tent. So last time we talked about our mosses. So they don't have xylem and phloem. They don't have that vasculature. They're really just absorbing sex through their cells and the cells in those little leaves. Um, but now we're moving into our first vascular plants. And uh, our first branching point is we have our ferns branches. Now, a lot of the structures, having just said that evolution continues even along these branches, um, if you look in the fossil record, you will see a lot of very fern-like structures in older plants. Right, the developments of seeds were newer and really do change things. Uh, so if you look at pictures of the dinosaurs, right, like little cartoons, you'll see lots of like fern trees going on there. That's because that is what we see in the fossil record. We see a bunch of these structures. So some of their traits are very basal. Uh, when we say something is basal, we mean that it's inherited from the base of the tree, like from the bottom of the tree. All right, so as we move into our vascular plants, we're going to be stepping through three major groups and then breaking them out into littler uh, sort of families. So our trajectory in this course uh, is to move towards our angiosperms, our flowering plants, um, because currently they are very, very diverse and they are important in our lives. And there are a lot of them around us. Uh, here in Minnesota. Hopefully, maybe spring will come. <laughs> I don't know that we're going to see any flowers, but we definitely will see some ants. So our first group that we're talking about today in our vascular plants are fern and fern allies. This group is also sometimes referred to as the pteridophyte, so that PT like pterodactyl pteridophyte. Uh, next week we'll start talking about our gymnosperms, nophida. Uh, we saw some of these already when we were learning how to look at dichotomous keys, but we'll dive in deeper as we move forward. And then eventually we'll move into our angiosperms, uh, our division magnolia phyta. Okay. So when we group these plants this way, right, I just gave it away, but this phyta ending does tell us about a taxonomic grouping, like a taxonomic level. So specifically when you see something ending in phyta, that's telling you, uh, we've, that's a division of plants, okay, so that's kind of a level. And when we're looking at these three major groups, one of the really obvious differences is going to be how they reproduce. Okay, so the pteridophytes, like our mosses, are going to reproduce using spores. Okay. And we're going to see a bunch of spore-related structures uh, in the pictures in this lecture, but also in lab on Thursday. Now, oops, right, 
animation's a, a little wonky there, but too fast. Um, but next week, we'll start looking at the gymnosperms. Um, so these are going to be where we start to see seeds. Okay. So we're going to see seeds, but not flowers in the gymnosperms. Uh, so we're going to see the seeds contained in these structures called culls, right? So like a pine cull, right? And finally, when we move into the angiosperms, that's when we're going to see uh, a new apomorphy, our flowers. So we'll move in uh, after spring break, probably, looking at flowers, looking at fruits. Uh, so they're going to be a seed plant and a pheromone pine, uh, looking at the families in Uh, so we're going to take a, a little look at some spores and structures moving. I have a little, little video here on ferns. And then the rest of my slides are mostly pictures showing you what these are going to look like so you can know what you're looking for in lab. I like seeing stuff move around, especially when we're talking about life cycles. That's the point here. Since the earliest of times, birds have been appreciated for their beauty and have provided shelter and sometimes food. The birth of their young coiled fronds has often been used in artwork such as the coru. Ferns are popular in our parks and gardens and even brought indoors to enhance our living spaces. There are as many as 12,000 species of ferns throughout the world. Some are the size of your fingernail, while others are as tall as a tree. In the wild, ferns are successful at reproducing and spreading throughout the forests. They do this by producing spores. This turned over. Small circular areas may be seen. Each of these areas is called the sorus. In some ferns, the sorus is unprotected. In many others, it is covered by a cap, supported by a central stalk. This protective covering is called an endusium. In some ferns, this covering is cup shaped. The source itself contains numerous sac like structures. Each of these is called a sporangium. The outer wall of the sporangium consists of a layer of protective jacket cells. As the sporangium matures, a row of jacket cells enlarge to form a band known as the annulus. The outer wall of each annulus cell is very thin and delicate. On the opposite side of the sporangium, several delicate root cells form. Below the jacket, there are two layers of cells called the tapetum, which nourish the fertile tissue within. The fertile tissue consists of sporocyte cells. Each sporocyte cell is diploid, containing two sets of chromosomes one from each parent. As each cell matures, its nucleus divides twice by the process of meiosis. Each daughter nucleus now contains one set of chromosomes. The cytoplasm of the sporocyte undergoes cleavage. This results in a cluster of four adhering cells called the tetrad.
the tapetum now begins to break down, depositing a very tough protective coat of sporopollenin. Surrounded by this thick resistant wall, each cell is now called a spore. The animus begins to dry out as water evaporates from its surface. The tension or pull between the remaining water molecules and the wall now increases. The thick inner and side walls resist this. And the thin outer walls are easily pulled inward. Pulling in the outer walls causes the annulus to contract much like an accordion. Shortening the annulus tears the lip cells apart. As the annulus continues to shorten, the tear enlarges and the spore case opens further. When too much water is lost, the water molecules are no longer able to hold together. And this happens, the pull on the wall is released and the annulus springs forward, closing the sporangium so fast that the spores are thrown out. This process is repeated in thousands of sporangia on the leaf, so that large quantities of spores are released. When spores land on a moist surface, those which germinate first will form bisexual or hermaphroditic individuals. A rhizoid emerges and attaches the spore to the soil. This is followed by a sheet of cells, which is the young gametophyte called prothallus. A notch forms on the prothallus that contains dividing cells. This is called the notch meristem. Continued growth results in a heart shaped bisexual gametophyte. The lower surface is firmly attached to the soil by numerous rhizoids. Male gametangia or gantheria are formed at the posterior end of the gametophyte. The outer wall of anthridium consists of ring cells and a cap cell which surround fertile tissue. At the anterior end of the prothallus, close to the notch, there are female gametangia called archegonia. An archegonium consists of a neck containing a neck canal cell. At the base of the neck, there is a swollen region called the venta that contains an egg cell. Gametangia of both sexes may be present at the same time or at different times. The timing of their appearance will determine if there will be self fertilization or cross fertilization. In some ferns, archegonia are formed first, and when flooded with water, a hormone called antheridium is released. This hormone will stimulate adjacent plants to stop growing and form antheridia, but no archegonia. A bisexual gametophyte in a female phase may therefore be surrounded by several male gametophytes, increasing the chances of cross fertilization. Being close to the soil, 
water flows in the rains. This water plays an important role in fertilization. Water stimulates the cap cell in the antheridium to open, releasing the sperm cells. The flagellated sperm are now able to move within the water in search of an egg. Sperm consists of a spiral cell body bearing numerous flagella that move and form them. Water also stimulates the archegonium to open. The contents of the neck canal then diffuse the surrounding water, where they act as a sperm attractant. The attractant stimulates the sperm to swim towards the open archegonium. Then swims into the opening and moves up the neck canal towards the egg cell. Fertilization is accomplished when the egg and sperm nuclei fuse. This creates a single diploid cell, the zygote. I say it remains attached to the depletion. Inside the archegonium on the lower surface of the gametophyte, the zygote begins to divide, forming the embryo sporified fly. The uppermost part of the embryo, the foot, absorbs nutrients from the surrounding gametophyte tissue. As the embryo grows, the venter tissue stretches and eventually ruptures. A root now grows into the soil for support and to absorb water. Other parts of the embryo form the first leaf and the future stem, the rhizome. A leaf grows through the notch in the gametophyte to reach the sunlight. Eventually, the rhizome emerges and provides additional leaves and roots. In this way, a new plant is born that matures into another spore producing plant, completing a reproductive cycle. We have seen that the fertile reproductive cycle contains two plants a large familiar spore plant or sporophyte and a tiny gamete plant or gametophyte. Using spores to travel great distances, and gametes which introduce genetic variability, ferns have spread and evolved throughout the world. Exciting for the ferns. Okay, so to recap all of this, in case we were getting a little sleepy, you can see that as we talk about the ferns, we're going to Start adding on to this idea of alternation of generations. And as we're looking at some of these structures uh, and describing our different groups of ferns and our fern kin or our other seedless vascular plants, um, we're going to be learning some new names for things. We talked a little bit about leaves and some of the ways we describe leaves in our earlier lab, um, but as we move through our different groups, we're gonna have some new alterations of terms, new ways we describe specific plants. Okay, so characteristics here of our pteridophytes or our uh, ferns and fern allies is that they're gonna spread by spores uh, like the mosses. Like all of our other plants that we're talking about in this class, we're gonna see that alternation of generation is a thing. Um, in this case, as we move into a fern, um, our mosses, we saw that what we were looking at was really the gametophyte. Uh, that's the bigger, more obvious uh, form of the plant. Uh, as we move forward now, we're going to see that when we're walking along in the forest and we see a fern, we're now going to see that the sporophyte is really big. And that's going to be true uh, kind of as we move forward into the rest of our plants. But we will look at both 
pieces in lab. Uh, so most of our ferns and fern allies are perennials, meaning they die off and come back. They like moist, shady terrestrial habitats usually. Uh, so we're going to rip them. You're going to see them in undergrowth a lot. You're going to see them in tropical areas a lot, although we do have some desert ferns. You can see maybe from that video that, that we kind of play with this idea of moisture when we're thinking about ferns. Um, and how they handle their reproduction. Right? They're using desiccation to fling their spores at everybody, right? But they are also using that moisture uh, to allow the ferns to swim around. Now, we also have aquatic ferns. Um, some are something called epiphytes, which uh, I am particularly excited by epiphytes, so we'll, we'll take a look at some of those. Um, but first, they're cool. About Two thirds of our species of fern are in tropical regions. Um, they vary in their, their morphology, which we will see on uh, Thursday. Okay. So I have some examples uh, for us of some things that would be ferns. Uh, they're not always gonna look like the exact picture you have in your mind of a fern. So we can see some aquatic ferns. Uh, the one over here on the left does have this uh, sort of typical feathery structure. Uh, but we're going to see that not all our fern fronds look like that. Some of them have these complete uh, sort of simple outlines, right? So we'll, we'll see some variation. Fern I'm really into right now. I haven't bought it yet, uh, but our staghorn fern. Seen some people mounting them like you mount deer heads, right? And putting ferns on their walls on plaques. Seems super cool. I'd like to learn how to do it. Uh, look into it if you're interested in thinking about how this plants. Okay, so those are our aquatic ferns. Uh, next, we have some epiphytic ferns. If you ever walk around in a rainforest, you may see a lot of ferns clinging to trees like the mosses do or sort of uh, nesting in branching points. An epiphyte is a plant that grows on another plant <laughs> uh, and kind of uses collected moisture and nutrients uh, in the bark or in the little crevice that it's in, in order to grow, as opposed to rooting into soil on its own. So we will see epiphytes in other groups as well. <laughs> tree ferns are super cool. Uh, so tree ferns look like trees, uh, but they are not. They're actually ferns. Um, these used to be much more common back in dinosaur times, um, but we still see some today and they're pretty awesome. Finally, here are a picture, some pictures of some desert ferns. So life is beautiful, life is adaptable. Uh, ferns have managed in some cases to adapt to very arid conditions, although most ferns really like their humidity. Okay, so we're gonna break down our pteridophytes uh, into further groupings. So two big groups that we'll think about are our lycophytes or the lycopod group versus the monophyte lights are our fern group. Um, so we're going to see that the lycopods look really different. And then the fern group, the monophytes are going to look more like actual fern. Okay. So we're going to kind of step through them. Uh, so we'll talk about the lycopodus phyta, the club mosses, spike mosses, and quillworts. So note that word moss in there. They are, however, not moss. They are vascular plants. And we'll see some examples in the lab on Thursday. So, uh, uh, I'm very bad at pronouncing some of these things. Uh, Silotophyta or the whisk ferns are going to look almost like bare sticks. They're pretty cool. Microphyllophyta, the horsetail. Uh, you'll see a bunch of them coming up in the spring whenever it gets here in Duluth. They look kind of like um, they look kind of like asparagus when they first come up, and apparently, if you collect them, they maybe taste a little like asparagus too. So. If they come up before class and uh, we can try them out. And then we'll move into the polypodiophyta or our true ferns. Okay, so here are some examples of trees, including these groups. Uh, so we have some options uh, for trees, right? So we do see these major groups though, right? So we see an earlier branching lycophyte group. And then we see our whisk ferns, horsetails, and our true ferns. Um, we can see that 
the arrangement um, varies here mainly based on how many groups they included, right? We see our horsetails and our true ferns kind of grouping together in both of these, right? So here's their common ancestor back here. And then we see the whisk ferns with an older common ancestor there. That's about the same arrangement we see in this tree as well. All right. So we're going to talk about those lycophytes first, those club mosses, spike mosses, and quillwort. There are first branching off groups of our vascular plants, so we do refer to them as the most basal group. We'll see that they have really small leaves. Uh, they're small, simple leaves called microphylls that have one vein and a world little leaf arrangement. Mm, some ancient lycophytes were tree-like and very, very large. They do have fossil lycophytes in the fossil record. The modern ones are real little. Here are some of the structures we'll look at in lab with our lycophytes. Uh, so we are going to see they have their little, little leaves. Okay. Um, inside the leaves, we're going to see microspores kind of nesting in. So we'll, we'll look in at these megaspores and microspores and the associated leaf-like structures in lab. Uh, and we'll also look at this sort of, what I call this, isn't quite a cone, but almost verging towards a cone-like structure called the strobilis. Uh, so the reproductive cycle of like a fight is a little bit different than the ferns that we just looked at in the YouTube video. We have some slightly different structures uh, involved there. Okay. Next group, as we're just sort of progressing down this tree, are the Silotophyta, the whisk ferns. So this is what I meant by saying they're kind of thick like. So this is literally what they look like. Uh, they lack true leaves or roots. Um, their sporangia, so where they're getting ready to do their reproductions and other spores, are in these little outgrowths, these little nubs, right? So they look kind of like the buds on our twig. They're not, though. They're filled with spores. Um, so all our photosynthesis has to happen in the green cell, sort of in this stem-like structure. Okay, and then we move into our horsetail groups. So this is where we're really going to see this strobilis structure. Um, and if you Google strobilis, it will bring up a lot of stuff about pine cones because uh, that is basically what cones evolved from was, was a structure kind of like this. Um, so this is where our sporangia are going to be uh, in our horse tails. We're going to see they have a hollow jointed kind of scaly stem. So this is that sort of asparagus-like structure that I was talking about. That's what it reminds me of. Uh, you can also make a tea of these. You can use them as straws. Personal foraging notes. I like them. All right. So now we're going to move into taking a little look at some of the structures for our true ferns, which is really what we think about when we think about the true. So our polypodia phyta are our true ferns. This is where we're going to see our large fronds with branching networks of things. So these are going to look a lot more like the leaves we were looking at when we were learning how to describe leaves. So we can see these fronds coming out. Um, but in some of our ferns, we're also going to see these separate structures where we have some of our reproductive structures. So we'll see variation in the reproductive uh, sort of cycle and structures throughout these different groups. So before, when we were talking about leaves, we talked about a leaf blade, we talked about a petiole. Uh, so those are familiar terms, hopefully over here on the left. And when we're talking about a fern, we talk about the whole thing as a frond, right? So this is gonna be the large structure. The pointy bit at the end is the apex, has a midrib like our other leaves do. Um, but now we're gonna talk about pinna and pinule when we're describing the shape here, okay? So we can see this, uh, Sort of division structure, this kind of fractal like structure in our ferns. Um, so basically, they're like compound leaves um, dividing and dividing and dividing to different levels depending on what species we're looking at. So here we see some outlines of some different shapes you might see when you are looking at a fern frond. So some of them are going to be simple, 
itself. And we're going to sort of move further and further towards a more and more compound kind of leaf, right? So some of them are only going to be almost deeply lobed here. And then we're going to see more and more division, depending on what we're looking at. So these are all things you might see if you're looking at. So I do want to zero in a little bit on some of these structures related to our spores and sporangia. So when we were talking, or when the video was talking, right, our spores are housed inside our structures called the sporangia. Right? The sporangia are these like individual little balls. And then this whole group together is called the sorus. Okay. So a spore in a sporangium in a sorus. One of the features we're going to be using to tell apart some of our ferns is something called an inducium. So the inducium is just the structure that potentially protects a sorus. Uh, so protecting kind of the, the spore containing structures. Uh, so this little umbrella you see in the center here is an example of an inducium. And as the video was showing us, this can take on sort of many shapes. This is something we could describe and put in a dichotomous key if we were trying to identify a specific type of fern. Okay. Uh, so other, oops. thank you, Joel. So other structures that we'll see related to in uh, reproduction are our megafills and microfills, big leaves and little leaves, uh, megasporophils and microsporophils. A big leaf with spores or sporangia, little leaf with spores or sporangia. We'll take a look at some of those under a microscope on Thursday. So this is really just kind of a summary slide defining some of the terms that we'll see later on. So zooming in a little more on some of those spore-related structures. Uh, so we're zooming in on the underside of a fern frond. So if you've ever looked at a fern and it looks like kind of crusty and red and you think it's infected, you are actually looking at its spore producing structures. Okay. So on the underside, you're going to see these little dots. Those are our sorus eye, which is the plural of sorus. So each little circle is a sorus. Maybe has a structure covering over some part of it, the inducium. Each little tiny circle within the larger circle is a sporangium. And then the spores are the little dots that are going to get flung around. Here's some more picture of the sporangia inside a sorus. So here we see one uh, that does not have an inducium on the left, right? So we just have sort of bare sporangia here in the sorus. But over here, again, we see an inducium here in the center. The inducium does not have to come from the center. It does have the picture. We'll also have something called a false inducium. Uh, so a false inducium would be if we have like the edge of the leaf kind of curling over our sori or over these spore containing structures to protect them, but it's not a separate structure from the leaf. It's actually first part of the frond. So that's the distinguishing factor for false inducium. Here are just some more reference pictures here of a sorus, of uh, an inducium, of the sporangia and the false inducium. So we can also see here some more uh, ways we might refer to parts of our fern. Um, so here, that little petiole we might and often do refer to as a stipe when we're talking about ferns. So this stipe would be this kind of stem structure. Uh, and then the central portion in a compound leaf, we would also sometimes call this the rachis. So this, this sort of midrib. Rachis is another word we might use. Um, and in some of our ferns, we're going to see that instead of having our little sori on the underside, we have a separate frond for reproduction. So this would be a fertile frond. You guys seen those in fields where you see those crunchy looking sticks, basically, uh, where there is a group of fern. That's what you're looking at. You're looking at a fertile frond versus uh, a sterile frond would look nice and green and leafy, have its pinnules and stuff, but you just don't see any reproductive structures on it, right? You don't see a sorus or any spores on the underside if you turn it over. Um, so that varies depending on the species. 
So here's just uh, another uh, sort of picture labeling out some parts of the fern a little more clearly. And I'll do some labeling in lab. But this is a reference slide. One thing I do want to key you in on here is as we're talking about the structures kind of at the base, all right, we're going to see these structures called rhizomes. And they are actually different than our roots, right? So we see rhizomes as these kind of bulb like structures. This is actually a modified version of a stem, and you can see uh, little leaves coming off of it, right? So the roots are down here. Um, and some of our ferns actually just have rhizoids, like the mosses, um, that just kind of cling onto things uh, and don't actually absorb nutrients. Lots of variation when we're talking about different trees. So most ferns do have roots. Uh, they also have these rhizomes, which are a modified version of a stem, but are going to kind of look like a root. And we'll see leaves that we're now going to call fronds. Our little young fronds are called fiddleheads, or sometimes croziers, or Ursinate vernation. I've literally never heard anyone say that out loud, but it is an equivalent term. Uh, so in the early spring, when people are looking to eat ferns, this is what they're looking for. These are the fiddleheads, these are the little baby ferns that you're looking for. Here's some zooms in uh, real pictures of the root versus the rhizome sort of distinguishing stuff. So here we have our little fragile roots versus the bigger rhizome. So if you were to try to propagate a fern, uh, so propagate is when you make more of something, basically. So if you wanted to cut up a fern and give little pieces to your friends so they could also grow your fern, uh, you might cut up the rhizome um, because it would be able to grow more leaves and grow little new roots. Actually, it does have roots already on it, so you might do this. And then send some on old frond with a little bit of the rhizome and then be able to grow. And in fact, we have some of these in the greenhouse that we will look at on Thursday. Here are some pictures of some different types of fiddleheads. So uh, as it gets into the spring, if you are interested in foraging and you are looking for fiddleheads, do be aware. That you're not just looking for any fiddleheads, and fiddleheads vary between uh, different species of ferns. So you're looking for, for very specific identifiable ones. Not all of them are edible. So please don't just go into the woods and start eating any little, little curled up fiddlehead. That would, that would be a bad thing. Okay. Now, for in reproduction, we've taken a little look at that little life cycle, but I do want to note that plant genetics get really complicated sometimes and a fern actually has the record for the organism with the most chromosomes uh so 1440 chromosomes so that's a lot <laughs> and the reason that plants can do this is that they are able to do this thing called polyploidy they'll have like duplication of genomes um so they can have more than two complete sets of chromosomes and that's relatively common in plants uh, to have this happen. So we end up seeing uh, a lot of big data if we're looking at, at sort of plant genetics. So the chromosome number, there's a reason I haven't pulled up chromosomes for you to look at uh, when we're talking about our plants yet. I have done some searching around for something that's relatively simple, but uh, it's tough, it's tough. The chromosome number is going to vary wildly when we're looking at our ferns, or sorry, when we're looking at our plants in general, but our ferns as well. Okay. So, recapping alternation of generations, we're thinking about a lot with our ferns. We also mentioned it with our mosses, uh, trying to sort of ease you in. There are a lot of terms related to plant reproduction, so we're trying to kind of build. Uh, so this is on our last set of slides for the mosses. So we're talking about the fact that these two things might appear as different plants. They are technically kind of different individuals, right? And this is an apomorphy of plant plants. 
basically this alternation of generations where we go from a diploid generation to haploid generation back to a diploid generation back and forth. So here is an outline of some of the things that we were talking about in that video. So some of this life cycle stuff, we'll zoom in and try and pair up some of the structures in the lab with this. Um, but if we're talking, we'll talk through it right now. Pick in a good color. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so if we're thinking about our typical fern that we see in the forest, um, we may be looking at an adult sporophyte, probably what we're looking at. We see just one with an underside covered with these sort of rust colored dots. We're looking at a fertile frond, so it is able to reproduce. And we know that because what we're looking at is a thorax, sporangia with spores ultimately inside. May or may not be covered by this tube. What's happening inside the sporangia is there, the cells in there are undergoing meiosis, producing those spores, right? So basically producing our uh, gametes. Eventually, the structure surrounding that sporangium is going to burst open. So we have this uh, structure holding it together called the annulus. When it shrinks, right, when these parts shrink, it gets shorter, ripping open the other side at the lip cells, lip cells flinging our spores everywhere, okay? And then they really get all over everything. Yeah. So these spores are now moving through the air, hopefully landing somewhere on the ground, right? Possibly landing in one of your other little house plants that can happen. Um, and now the gametophyte is going to start to develop. So this is where we're having our division, right? At meiosis, right, our division between haploid and diploid. Right, so our sporophytes are our diploid generation, right? Those two ends versus as we have these spores and the developing gametophytes, everything over here is haploid. So we have this developing gametophyte, right? So it's getting bigger, bigger. Um, so we have our, what were they saying in the video? Heart shaped bisexual gametophyte. I thought that was um, and accurate, all right? So we're going to have two areas on developing gametophytes. So we're going to have an area where we're forming egg cells and an area where we are forming sperm cells, essentially. So these are in different types of structures. So our archegonium is related to the egg cell, the female structures are antheridium. Antheridia, girl, where we're going to see the sperm cells develop. Uh, and it is worth remembering these terms now because we're going to see this again as we talk about uh, our angiosperms. We're going to focus in on some of these same words when we're looking at flower structures, for example. So egg cell and sperm cell come together in fertilization. And then we start to see a sporophyte, our new generation, climbing out and growing out of this parent gametophyte starting the cycle over again. Here are summary slides uh, letting you know, like having it in text. We have our source, that big circle. Inside it is the sporangium. Inside that are the spores, uh, which are creating our haploid gametophyte as they germinate, germination being like kind of like antheridium contains sperm, this is the male structure, the archegonium, the female structure contains eggs. So here we see some pictures. I really like this picture of an actual gametophyte through a microscope, right? It really is a beautiful art. We do have a, a little on theme material for today, right? Okay. So our little gametophyte here through a microscope, we can see a spore here as well. And then we see a cartoon of how this structure is going to kind of develop as we move into the sporophyte generation. So we have that sporophyte sprouting out from our gametophyte. All right. And that's it for today. So here are some questions that I want you to be thinking about now, but like after uh, lab, hopefully we'll kind of cement in what our sporophyte generations look like. 
I want to be thinking about this diploid, haploid difference, uh, thinking about how sporophytes and gametophytes are different. Um, and I'll be learning a new word, heterosporous. So I want you to kind of predict in your mind what that might be.